I'm Lillian Vasquez with Lifestyles on KBCR. Thanks for listening. Dr. Mona Delahook is a child psychologist with more than 30 years of experience and an author who recently wrote the book Beyond Behaviors. In Beyond Behaviors, she discusses the importance of understanding behavior and how using compassion and science is the key to solving challenges with children. Dr. Della Hook says that current approaches to behavior challenges and developmental differences are outdated and shares effective neuroscience-based strategies and solutions for use in the classroom, at home, and in the community. Welcome to Lifestyles. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me, Lillian. So you write in the book that too often we assume a child is intentionally misbehaving. And I know parents face this so often when they're in their community and it looks like that child is being bad or they're not disciplining that child well, when in fact they are acting out on their own survival instincts. Share what you mean by that. Yes. Well, the way we currently look at behaviors is we take what we see at face value. So I often think of behaviors as an iceberg. So you know uh, how the tip of the iceberg is generally, um, it's what you see on the top of the water, above the water. Right. But that's only about 10, you know, 12% of an iceberg is what you can see. But the bigger chunk of ice is underneath, it's invisible, it's underneath the water line. So that's how I view behaviors. Behaviors of what we see don't tell you anything about what the causality is or what's really going on inside a child. And so for parents that, you know, may not see the iceberg or only seeing the behavior, how do they dig deeper to get to the root of, of the causation or what's, what's really going on? Absolutely. One of the cool things that I find parents find very reassuring, because all of us have been in that situation where a child is tantruming at the grocery store or out of control, and it's embarrassing, and and the eyes are on us, so it, it puts a lot of stress on parents. But we can think about behaviors in a new way, and one way is to understand behaviors as what we call stress responses. So on the tip, what you'll see is a child misbehaving, right. but underneath, you may have a child in um, distress, essentially. And some of the most challenging behaviors when a child is screaming, kicking, yelling, running away, those type of behaviors indicate distress in a child where they are not able to control their emotions or their behaviors. So it opens up a whole new door of how we view the behavior, but also how to, what we do to support the child. Let's take, for example, you're in the store, the child is acting out, and if we don't know what the cause is, you know, maybe it's the lights twinkling. Maybe it's the the noise that they can hear more acutely. Maybe it's the too much uh, sensory input. We don't know what it is because we're only seeing the tip of the iceberg. So how does one sure. dig deeper? You're right. We don't need to exactly know. Maybe that child is exhausted and tired or catching a cold. So what really matters isn't that we decide right away what the cause is but that we understand what to do in the moment based on the child's level of distress. So one thing I talk about a lot is how we understand when a child is what we call in the red pathway. What is that? When a child is in the red, they're not in control of their their behaviors or their emotions. So asking them to do something, actually talking to them logically is not going to work very well. That's why uh, when you're when a child is tantruming and you're lecturing them, they get worse, right? Mm-hmm. So what we want to do is recognize, first of all, when the child is in the red pathway and they're in distress, what we do is we don't talk as much. We stay exquisitely calm ourselves, which mm-hmm. is very hard. True. And we, and we try to get out of that store as quickly and easily as possible because we understand the child needs to be away from the situation and to calm their body and their mind down. The way humans calm their bodies and minds down is through warmth and connection from caregivers. So it's really, instead of going to discipline or if you don't calm down, I'm going to have to grab you and take you out of here, we move from that to, oh my goodness, sweetie, you are you are in distress. There is something going on with you right now. How can I help? Let's go to the car. And do you think the child, um, whether it's a typical child or one with autism, do you think they they get that, even though you're calm? So if they're in their fight or flight mode and at their peak of their meltdown and you're calmly saying, 
oh my, we need to step out and be be soft and calm. Do you think yeah. they're really getting that, or do you have to wait till that that meltdown kind of calms down so you can then approach it? What- Great question. You're absolutely right. When they're in the throes of it, uh, they can't hear very well. Right. The middle ears attenuate. They they lose their ability to hear. This is from our from our evolutionary history. When the fight or flight is engaged, you're not hearing well and you're not processing human voices. Mm. Okay. So what we what we want to do is remember we don't say very much, and how we are is more important than what we say because the child cannot distinguish logical, thoughtful talk. They are in a fight or flight response. So what do we do? We talk less. We have a calm look on our body posture. We can get down to the child's level. We remember to use sounds that are uh, warm and engaging instead of low and rumbling and loud. And all of those things give cues to the child's body and mind that they can start to reduce their heart rate and they can calm down. So it's remember, it's not as much as what we say, but how we are. Right. And so when we're talking about behaviors, and right now I'm kind of visualizing a younger child. Okay. With autism and there are wherever they may appear on the spectrum, they may have different levels of cognitive ability. So when a two-year-old is having a meltdown or a five-year-old is having a meltdown as opposed to a 16-year-old having a meltdown but still may have that younger cognitive uh, brain that do you handle it the same way when you know let's face it a two-year-old or a five-year-old throwing a tantrum looks a lot different than a 15-year-old young man throwing a tantrum and how you get out of that right it looks a lot different because that the individual is physically larger right um but the most important guiding principle is the developmental age and not the chronological age. Right. So uh, the underlying process is very much the same, no matter how old you are. If okay. you're a child or an adult, when your threat response system is triggered, when you're in a fight or flight and you detect something that's threatening from relationships or the environment, the fight or flight is engaged. So what we want to look at isn't necessarily what you do based on age, but what you do based on that individual's unique needs and their differences. Let me also say that I believe in in terms of autism that the statistics on cognitive challenges in individuals with autism are greatly over-exaggerated. So I, uh, I believe that the reason the statistics of cognitive delay are so high is that many autistic individuals are not well tested by uh, standardized testing, and so it underplays um, their cognitive abilities. So I encourage parents and providers and teachers to always assume that the child is understanding what you're saying, even if they can't respond with their body or with their words. Right. So what you're saying is there's more there than meets the eye. Absolutely. And we must presume competency rather than presuming incompetence. And how do you instill that in teachers? Because they have, you know, let's say it's in a special ed class. They may have 12 to 14 students, maybe with a couple of instructional aides. How are they able to decipher that? You know, if they're giving them work that's really a four-year-old, but really they may be at a higher level and don't want to do that because they are at a higher level and maybe that's the behavior of fighting doing that that project does that make sense absolutely and uh, this is a lot uh, of what i write and blog about i want teachers to know because i've worked with special populations for 25 plus years that we are seriously underestimating our special needs populations and that is why i wrote a book called beyond behaviors we, we must look beyond behaviors. We have such a bias about what we expect to be typical. And I put that in quotes. So a child, for example, in, in your example, who is bored and who is understimulated and who, whose teacher, albeit well-meaning, I have great sure. respect for special ed teachers, and I want to say that up front. Sure. The problem is their education and training is still steeped in behavioral modification 
and an understanding of autism as a checklist of behavioral symptoms. And our educational system takes many decades to change, and current brain science is light years ahead of our educational system. So our teachers don't necessarily have this information. But I would say is we need parents to insist that their IEP teams, that is their individual educational plan teams, their child's educational teams, require that their teachers understand their child's unique um, strengths and that their challenges aren't secondary to a disorder I don't consider autism a disorder. They're secondary to their brain and body wiring differences. And so once we get that, our children soar. They do so well, and they're happy, and they're learning, and they're engaged, and they're bright. And there's a huge upside here. So let's take it out of the special ed classroom and put it in the regular ed classroom where a regular ed teacher may have a child with autism in the classroom because he or she is doing well and is able to mainstream and that teacher now is being asked to know even more about the special ed population. Yes. And that's, that's kind of a, when they have 30, 34 students, can be a, a huge challenge. What do you say to the regular ed teacher? Absolutely. And, and my heart goes out to, to teachers in general because in, in many of our classrooms, there, there are so many students to teacher ratios, and teachers are absolutely awesome. So I like to say in whenever I'm interviewed that what I'm about to say is a no blame, no shame zone. Sure. And I don't intend any, I, I, I do not believe that teachers want anything but the best for their students. But here's the bottom line. Our special ed teachers are undereducated about autism and about neurodiversity and different needs. And our regular ed teachers are as well. So it's not surprising that a regular ed teacher would have a child come into the classroom and they will be advised by the school psychologist or a behavioral team to use a certain kind of approach to children and that is modifying their surface behaviors. And this is what I'd like to get across to, again, to parents, to teachers, to my respected colleagues is that we must look beyond behaviors. When we are focusing on a behavior, we will tend to say, oh, that child is tapping on their desk, or that child is, can't sit in their seat, or that child is doing something that looks quote unquote odd. Instead of saying, I have a neurodivergent child in my classroom and I really want to get to know what these movements mean for the child. And I certainly don't want to judge those movements as either bad or uh, something I want to target to eliminate before I understand if this is a part of how that child functions in their life. All right, well, let's take it from there. Let's say that is going on. Let's say the child is rocking or is tapping or is uh, video scripting or, you know, how is the teacher supposed to know? Because sometimes the parents don't always know why the child is doing that. If it's a regular STEM that they're doing and that's their stimulation that they're doing, how is the teacher supposed to know that? How do they dig deeper? And right. if the child is nonverbal, right. how do they dig deeper? Okay, so here's the answer. We always dig deeper because behaviors are not some random occurrence that a child is doing just for the heck of it. Behaviors have meaning. And so let's just think about something called sensory and movement differences. What that means is individuals diagnosed with autism and other types of neurodiversity have unique sensory and movement differences. That is, they move their bodies differently and they um, have to make accommodations. And we think about these accommodations that they make as things people do, things children do, and adults, to ease the circumstances of their life. So what I like to tell teachers is that this behavior is likely serving a very good purpose for this child. Uh, perhaps the child is overstimulated by what they're hearing, by their, the auditory environment in a classroom. Many children are. When they are tapping on the desk or moving their body in a certain way, that is their way of managing that overstimulation because movement helps human beings manage stress. And so then we allow uh, that child to do that movement 
and then we and we let the aides and the other students in the in the classroom know that we can have respect for the different ways our bodies show us what they need. After a quick break, Dr. Della Hook talks about how to approach behavior in society and breaks down some steps to help solve challenges. You're listening to Lifestyles. I'm Lillian Vasquez. If you're just joining us on speaking with Dr. Mona Delahook, child psychologist and author of the book Beyond Behaviors. Okay, so let's get out of the special ed classroom and go into the society and typical world. And some of those behaviors are going on and they may seem inappropriate where they are, whether it's a grocery store or the library or wherever. And then how does the parent handle that? so that the person fits into the society or do you let them just stem and do their thing because that's how they're able to control themselves in that environment well a two-armed approach or maybe three the first one is that we need as many people as possible and and thanks to you we're talking about it today we need as many pe- people as possible educating the public about a new way of viewing behaviors that are different so um, the the idea of a child doing, for example, I was taught in, in my training that, quote, unquote, stimming, right, Stimul- self-stimulation, stimming with a behavior over and over again is a sign of a disorder. But what I know now from studying brain science and working with some of the top neuroscientists in the world about learning about the brain and body connection is that these behaviors are brilliant adaptations. They are something that we need to tell, uh, you know, your neighbor and your grandparents and and people at the grocery store. (laughs) This child is doing something that eases the circumstances of their life. And just as we have a tolerance for uh, different cultural and religious traditions, we have to have a tolerance, greater tolerance for movement and how our bodies hold themselves. Um, Those are also differences. So we can work on it on a cultural level. On a practical level, some of my um, patients' uh, parents and caregivers carry a card around. It might be a card large enough with words that says, my child is autistic, the child is is in a behavior, and I am okay. In other words, uh, sometimes people hand out a card that that helps uh, those around them understand that this is this is okay. They don't need to judge. They don't need to call for help. Um, and perhaps that will also allow them to be more compassionate and loving towards that child. And, and children and teenagers and people with differences will feel that compassion. My guest is Dr. Mona Della Hook. She has written a book called Beyond Behaviors. As you just mentioned, let's say, you know, every parent, every caregiver has their choice to self-disclose or to not disclose. That, of course, is their their right. And they may pick and choose their time when they want to self-disclose or, sure. and share. And they may say, no, I don't have time for this right now. I'm getting the kid out of here and right. I'm just going to get through it. <laughs> of course. <laughs> um, you know, I, as reading yeah. this book, you write the book like a, like a textbook. It reminded me when reading it that being back in college and and because you you'd go through so many steps who did you have in mind when you wrote the book well i had in mind everybody <laughs> <laughs> because i work with i work with parents and professionals all the time but my i think my main motivation for writing the book and the reason i included a lot of neuroscience in it and that it reads as a textbook is that I wanted parents to carry this book into IEPs and feel like it was weighty <laughs> evidence to help them get what their child, help their team understand what their child needs. So I'd say the audience that I was looking to persuade is probably professionals across disciplines, everything from teachers to OTs to PTs to pediatricians to psychiatrists and mental health professionals because um, I believe that we are currently underserving many of our different populations. As a professional in reading the book and as you speak now, you make it sound easy. It's kind of a step-by-step, follow these rules. 
But working on behaviors is not easy, but maybe following some techniques can make things better. Right. And and so what kind of, uh, and, and we know one size does not fit all when it comes to anything, maybe t-shirts, but even that doesn't work. What do you, what's your kind of elevator speech or three tips or tips that you suggest to parents that even just by listening to this interview, they may walk away with some information or things they might be able to try with their child or with their student? Sure. Like you said, there are no size, one size fits all plans. And sometimes as a parent, there you have no choice but to do that which you can do in the moment, right? And if you have to leave the pick up the child if they're young and leave the store, sometimes you just have to do that. Right. But a couple of things. Uh, first of all, what we know um, about human beings is that human beings all crave human connection. So when in doubt, connect. But I have four steps that parents can think about as they are trying to help their child with behaviors, and it forms the acronym IDEA. I is for inquire about these behaviors. Try to discover patterns. Inquire about your child's patterns. Number two, determine um, what circumstances are causing or adding or triggering your child's distress. Now, again, this will take a little bit of thought, um, mm-hmm. but we go on to once we have ID and then E and A, E is just examine what that means about the triggers and underlying causes. And then A, then you address them. You figure out what you need to do through your interactions with the child or if you need professional support, therapeutic support, you will understand once you go through this idea for a few weeks, you'll understand uh, if you need to contact an occupational therapist, for example, or call your child's pediatrician, or uh, look towards um, uh, making sure your child gets more sleep. So I'd say that those four steps, idea, inquire, determine what your child needs, examine what those triggers and causes are, and then address them is is the pathway that I'm suggesting um, for, for parents and professionals to slow the train down and remember that sometimes it pays to slow down and take a new look at a child's behaviors. And briefly, tell me about the, or just talk in general about the impact of the stress on the brain. Right. There's been quite a bit of research on on stress on the brain ever since the the new imaging technologies came into play, right? The functional images that can look inside the brain. So we know that stress is a, a major component. And what it does is that stress triggers a whole a whole uh, cascade of changes in the brain that cause uh, one's body to work hard to help the person feel safe. And the technical is the HPA axis, hypothalamus, pituitary, adrenal gland, so it affects all, the whole body. And then when you're under stress, the body triggers, uh, lets uh, adrenaline out, and then you have something, another chemical called cortisol that comes in to try to calm things down. But the bottom line is that over time, if a person is experiencing this type of stress, that it continues over and over and over again, day after day for a long period of time, then that's known as toxic stress. Mm. So we all have stress, right? But usually it doesn't last day after day, month after month. Right. And so the kind of stress we want to really be looking out for, uh, for ourselves as parents and professionals and for our children, is the toxic stress. And that is if a child appears to be under this kind of fight or flight response or shut down which means which is even worse than a fight or flight if they're totally shut down that's a big sign of toxic stress um and and make sure it it doesn't progress into trauma we we need to track it my guest has been dr mona delhook she's written a new book and it's titled beyond behaviors thank you so much for your time and sharing I, i wish we had more time but it's been great speaking with you Oh, thank you so much. It's been my pleasure. To learn more about Dr. Mona Delahook and her book, Beyond Behaviors, visit our website at kvcrnews.org slash lifestyles and click on today's show.